Okay, our career competitor today is a best-selling author and CEO of Learn It, a global leader in corporate training solutions that has upskilled over 1.8 million professionals in the past 28 years. Furthermore, our guest today epitomizes the very ideals this podcast was built upon as they established their competitive roots in the sport of baseball, having played it all the way to the professional ranks before turning his efforts towards business. It's clear our guest found a way to take the qualities that made him the player he was and applied them towards becoming an industry expert in the world of leadership, highlighted by his recent book, The Learn It All Leader, which provides the message that leaders are not born and they are not made, but they are constantly in the making. It's my pleasure to be welcoming into career competitor, Mr. Damon Lemby. Damon, how are we doing? Steve, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man, I'm excited to dive into this There's stuff there in the book. There's stuff there in the, obviously the organization. We'll go back to your baseball days a little bit. We'll tie it all together with some other stuff. There's so much to bounce around here and I've been looking forward to this for some time now, but let's start just by telling folks a little bit about what your typical day looks like these days as the CEO there at Learn It. So what does my day look like? First of all, as you mentioned, Learn It is a corporate training company. And really what we do is we help Customers turn to us when they're looking to upskill new managers. Maybe somebody's in a first-time manager role and they don't have the necessary skills, or if they really want to build out a culture of learning, or maybe they just want to learn how to use Excel better. And we partner with our customers and we build learning programs. And we do a lot of it through virtual instructor-led training, in-person as well. And what my typical day looks like, well... First of all, I get out of the house. I got a five-year-old and a two-year-old, so I got to get out of the house. I come down and I try to spend my time on the business more than in the business, which cool. I think is somewhat of a challenge as a small business owner, but that's really something that I've been mindful of and look at higher level activities that can grow the business for the future than getting into the weeds, if that makes sense. It makes total sense. I love it straight away. I mean, I, there's, there's already mirroring uh, elements to both of our days right there. It starts with the kiddos mm -hmm. and then you dive into the business. But like you said, there's that ability to work on the business and not be almost submerged within it. And it immediately, my mind is already going very quick in regards to some leadership qualities that come with that. So why don't you just speak to your very own, the ones you know best, right? You know how you run your organization. You know how you've been developing yourself as a leader now for some years. So talk to me a little bit about when you think about that perspective, working on the business versus working in the business as a leader, talk us through that very perspective. Well, I think it all kind of starts with having a vision and purpose for your organizations. You know, what do you stand for? What are you trying to achieve? And then from there, which is critical, is building a great team, surrounding yourself with people who a lot of times are better than you are, who are sharper than you are, but then giving them the autonomy to be able to delegate out what needs to be done and giving them the freedom to go out, try things and make mistakes, learn from those mistakes and move the business forward. I think it's really critical for all leaders and managers of all levels is to have great people, you know, support them, but give them the opportunity to do the work that you brought them on for. Yeah. So here we are, we're already diving into the sports world where, and whether you realize it or not, like, you know, there's some of those qualities that make those great teams great, those great players great. It's knowing when to pass the ball, knowing when to give somebody else the responsibility in any given moment and to hear someone that's been doing what they've been doing now for close to 30 years to be able to say that to this day, you are still focused on empowering others to take that ownership from you and be responsible for the success of the business. That's what I'm hearing. Correct. And I think I learned a lot of it. We can get into it. I learned a lot of it from playing from some amazing baseball coaches throughout the years. And when it comes to success, though, I'm a big believer that the success should go to your team. Put them in the forefront of the success. And as a leader... You own the mistakes, the downsides, the negatives. I think it goes a long way if you celebrate the successes and you have your team shine for it. I think it really helps them with their motivation and want to strive to do more. Yes. You've already referenced some of those coaches that you've worked with. I know you've worked with somewhat like three Hall of Fame coaches. Does that sound right? Correct. My first year out of was with Andy Lopez at Pepperdine, who mm -hmm. is the only coach to play to coach three Division One teams in the College World Series. He won two World Series, one at Pepperdine and one at University of Arizona. When I transferred, I played for a year for John Nochi, 
uh, one of the winningest coaches in junior college history. And he's an unbelievable head coach of the uh, Olympic team for a while in Italy. And then I played for the legendary Jim Brock in the final year of his life at Arizona State. Wow. So a lot of my leadership skills have really been modeled after those three gentlemen, plus my father. Yeah. And that what I've always found so interesting, and I take this as a lesson from the world of soccer growing up in England too, is the way in which we sometimes trade the term manager and coach. And it's, it's interesting in baseball, right? It's always been manager. It's always been manager. And I find that to be such a deliberate term and an interesting term when it comes to leadership, because it is highlighting in that title that this isn't just about motivating people there's an element of teaching there's an element of exploring what it means to have ownership of your role much like a manager would have in any office building you know around the world and, and so i'm curious when you look across those hugely influential people in your life how did they teach you the managing part of leadership that you're able to obviously apply today steve i think it's interesting i look at it too you said coach and manager I look at being a leader and a manager as two separate things as well. Because a lot of times leaders are the ones who go out there and create the direction and they create the vision and managers are really the ones who implement it. They take the vision that's created and they implement it. Like what I learned from playing for Andy Lopez, we were a small D1 team. And from day one, he said, we're going to win the College World Series. That was his vision. And him and I connected 30 years later, just recently when my book came out, he said he would go around and he would tell people, like he told myself, that that's what he was using in his recruiting speech. And other coaches would call him and say, do you really think that that's a good idea to be telling people this? And he said, yes, because that's what we're going to do. And that's what he did. And I look at it like they won the World Series, unfortunately, the year after I left. But he set the vision as a leader. And then he got his manager's or the coaches, you know, to kind of carry it out. And so that was a big lesson that I learned is that leaders need to know, learn how to inspire and create the purpose and the direction. Yeah, absolutely. And there's something that you said there, which I immediately jump on is that notion that the coach was able just to say, you know, that's what we're going to do. That's why I'm yeah. telling everybody this is because that's what we're going to do. And the definitive way of looking at it like that, it makes it so wonderfully black and white. Sometimes we try to pick at these sort of things like, how can we do this? And why yeah. will we do this? And just to be able to literally say, hey, I'm telling people that we're going to do this, guys. Like, this is what we're doing. This is where we're heading here. I'm that sure that I'm just going to continue to speak it until I'm proven otherwise, <laughs> you know? So it's fascinating to me. And you know, Steve, it's not always about what you say. But it's mm. about how you say it too. Mm. You yeah. know, if you say it with a definitive tone, if you're like, hey, you know what, we're gonna win the World Series, or you know what, we're gonna win this big deal, but you don't believe it in your body language and your actions. I'm a big believer a lot of times it's less about what you say and it's more about how you say it. And so I think that that's important to keep in mind. Absolutely. No, I love that. It's such an important, you know, just little asterisk to put over that little caveat, just like, hey, you know, say it all you want, but focus mm -hmm. on the way in which you're saying it as well. Well, you referenced it to me off air, and I want to touch on this now a little bit, is that you are coming from sports as you did and clearly doing that transitional part of your life very successfully and, and continuing to do it today. Clearly, just from the way in which you've recruited and built your business, you've had this appetite and this heightened awareness, let's say, like, hey, where are the athletes at? Where are my athletes and how do I bring them in here and get them to sort of do with me what I've obviously been able to do myself? Talk to me a little bit about that importance of finding athletes and why it is, more specifically, athletes are such a valuable asset to have within an organization. Oh, it's a great question. And my story, when my baseball career ended, I was, you know, devastated, like I'm sure a lot of athletes were. And I was concerned. I'm like, do I have any transferable skills that I could use in the real world? And I wasn't sure. But, you know, I worked hard and I developed those skills. And what I learned to, to answer your question is for those athletes out there listening, you have the skills necessary to be successful in the workforce, to be entrepreneurs, or in my case, a lot of times I've had great success hiring athletes in sales. And a lot of those transferable skills I look at, one is teamwork and collaboration. You know, athletes know how to collaborate. But athletes, Steve, they also know how to learn. Athletes have learning agility because they're so used to practicing and just picking up things and adapting. So that's another one. Another thing is typically athletes, they take care of themselves from a health perspective. And that's not something that people pay attention of too much is that, but that's an important part. When you're keeping yourself in good physical condition, keeps your mind sharp and helps you be successful. 
But a big one is also the resilience and I think the courage that athletes have. I can't really speak for swimming, but for baseball, if you fail seven out of 10 times, you dust yourself back up, you get back up, you could be a millionaire. So it's all about dealing with failure. Athletes have to learn to deal with failure and put it behind them, learn from that failure and keep improving. So that's why over the years, I've been such an advocate to help athletes. With their yeah, transition. well, and again, you're preaching to the choir. I'm, I'm all too familiar with this. It's, as I alluded to in the introduction, it's always so exciting for me to have someone come on and be such a prime example, not just in terms of your own story, but then how you're actually then passing it along and how you're encouraging athletes to see the value that they can have far beyond this sport. And it is something, sadly, that those that didn't take sports far struggle to sort of understand that that transitional element because it is i've had this conversation hundreds of times now with athletes over the years you go through a very similar experience a big loss in your life there's there is grievance that goes with the loss of your athletic career you know it's a real transition i'm curious just let's touch on that before i go where i was heading you know as you brought these athletes in have those sort of conversations ever come up i guess in your experience have you been able to sit with a former athlete and just see them and understand them and maybe even work through some of that stuff. And I assume successfully. Yeah. So the way I look at it is I think athletes have a kind of a special bond in the sense that, and it doesn't have to be just baseball players and baseball. It could be soccer, tennis, golf. But I think in general, athletes have this bond where they just communicate. They know how to communicate with each other and they have that competitiveness. And I've sat down with a lot of athletes who are uh, new, you know, with their, as far as their sports career ending. And it is a really big loss. And all I try to do is say, hey, look, if I'm able to do this, you're able to do it too. Because you have the mental toughness to be able to do it. Sometimes it gets through, sometimes it doesn't. Like I said, for us, we've hired, I mean, I'd say probably right now, 10 or 15% of our staff, and I don't do this just on purpose, a lot of the referrals are former D1 or professional athletes that we have on our team. Now, not all of them pan out, but a lot of them do. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, And there's something about that with athletes. There's no doubt about it. And the, the bond that you talk about, I get it. Like everywhere I go, wherever I meet someone, if we both have a background in sport, we'll end up discussing it and we'll end up have some sort of shared commonality between the two of us. And the term you used earlier... I think is a really interesting term, learning agility, in mm -hmm. terms of how that can maybe be spoken and explained a little bit now in a way that everybody can comprehend, everybody can understand, and everybody can relate to. Because here you are providing what you provide to organizations, which is all about educational components right. and how you can help them learn whatever it may be in ways much more effectively. So having people behind the scenes that have that ability to pick things up quickly, to adapt to something new, new information quickly, it must be just absolutely essential when you think about all members, not necessarily just someone with an athlete background, but all members there within the organization, right? Well, I look at it this way. The studies have shown that the lifespan of skills in the past were three to five years. So you acquire these skills, you have three to five years. With the rapid acceleration of change these days, Steve, they're saying that your, your skills last for about six months. So mm -hmm. you have to keep learning. And that's why I think a lot of times you can look at learning agility, which I consider to be the ability to learn, to be a lifelong learner. There's almost table stakes these days. In a lot of ways, it can be the most important skill that you have as we deal with what's going on with generative AI, chat GPT, or just how the world's moving. And I think that it's critical these days for you to be able to be a, um, you know, I use the term learn it all, but, you know, somebody who's continuously learning and wanting to evolve in their career. Yeah, to be honest with you, man, like this podcast does for me as much as anything is I love to read. I love to check out other people's stuff. But this having people come on with every single time someone joins the show, it's a different background, learn different something. perspective. I learn something every single time. It's, what I, it's one of my favorite things that I look forward to. I'm already learning a couple of nuggets here through our time together and you just referenced what you call the learn it all and that is obviously the title of the book so a wonderful opportunity here to segue right into that so i would love to just firstly it's one of my favorite questions to ask having written a book myself is why was this the book that you specifically needed to write why was this obviously damon's book and hey this has to be authored by me well it's funny because i've been at this for learn it for uh, 28 years, basically my whole professional career. I've done other stuff on the side. 
And at first it was going to be from my background, I come from a really successful real estate family. And, and at first my idea was to be kind of like a memoir and talk about my family and tie in leadership stuff. But as I got into it and telling the stories, I really got excited when I built all these stories about sharing what I've learned over the years, the successes, but really a lot of the failures. And I enjoy coaching individuals who come to me for advice, other leaders. And so that was really my goal with it was to put out something that, well, for number one, that my kids will be proud of as I grow up and they can learn more about me and my father who started Learn It, who passed away in 2010. So they can learn a little bit more about him, but also something I can give back to hopefully to future leaders of the world. When I say leader, learn it all leader, you don't have to run it, manage a team. You could be a leader in college. You could be somebody as part of your project that's a leader. You could be an individual contributor at work who is a leader, or you can be a leader at home with your family. So that was really what inspired me to write the book was take the learning lessons I had, share with them stories. And from my perspective, and, and give practical advice and actionable tips that they could use moving forward. Yeah, Because like I said, if I can do it, you can do it too. <laughs> and we definitely sing from the same hymn sheet with this stuff. I think we both have that element of humility when it comes to what we do. It's just like, come on, man, we're not reinventing the wheel here. You know, if, if we can see it and we can understand it, then there's no reason why you can't see it and you can't understand it. And so I hear that in abundance, which is great. Something you alluded to, which I myself pride myself on, is being able to acknowledge the failures, being able to say like, I'm actually learning. And I say this from my experience, I've learned so much more from either my own or the failures of others in terms of how best to actually do something. And the beauty of the failure is the lesson that is learned every single time. I think it's so powerful. A lot of people will refrain from allowing themselves to fail uh -huh. because, oh no, I failed. It's just like, well, just step into the failure, take something from it. And go again, right? Go again. See, see what can come off the back of that the first time. I'm 100% with you. And going back to something you said a minute ago, you don't need to reinvent the wheel, right? Mm -hmm. And there is, I did this in baseball and I do this through the books I read, through the podcasts I listen to, is like in baseball, not every batting stance or style work for everybody, but you could take pieces of people's approach and add them for your own. So it's something, and that's why I think it's so important to be open to learning is that there's so much good advice out there or people who have experience that you can repurpose and use for yourself. Now, when you talk about being humble, one of the key traits I, I really look at, there's four key traits to being a learn it all. I think one is we just talked about humility. Number two is curiosity, integrity, and courage. But for humility, I think that it's important to be able to be vulnerable, right? Mm -hmm. So to not having to be the smartest person in the room all the time and say, you know what? I don't know, or I made a mistake. Now with being vulnerable, you got to be a little careful. You don't want to go overboard with it, right? Where you're just constantly apologizing. And because that way, if you're managing a team, people are like, well, how do I know if I should even trust this person? Right. Right. So the old thought of leaders was, oh, you never admit mistakes. You don't want to admit any weakness. That's not what it is these days. I believe great leaders are like, hey, you know what? I made a mistake. I don't know. Surround yourself with people with diverse opinions. Be curious about what they have to say and learn from them. And that's what I think it takes. Uh, and that's where vulnerability really plays in. Absolutely. And it's why the message that you put there front and center with the book of this, like, we're not born, we're not made, but we're in the making. And, and like that ability to just accept that like you said earlier the, the the learning agility every six months things evolve things evolve and i made this joke recently i think i was talking to my wife about this i said i don't think it's a coincidence that here we are some 20 plus years now giving women the time and the opportunities they deserve in leadership roles and now we men are having to learn how to be vulnerable and how to be emotionally intelligent. These aren't coincidences. These are because we've given women the opportunities they very much deserve in roles of leadership. And now as men, we have to adapt to these significantly sought after traits within Absolutely. leaders. These are really powerful things that allow you to actually break that bar of boss and employee break right through that and just be person to person, human to human, you know? And I think that is clearly where leadership has gone. And I love that straight away, instead of picking one side of the, were you born or were you bred? I said, no, 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 turns out that there's a whole nother side that you guys aren't even considering.
Well, first of all, I'll say, I think women are phenomenal leaders. Sure. And throughout my years, if you look at my team now, but also a lot of the alumni who've come through, women are fantastic leaders. They tend to be better listeners and higher emotional intelligence. So 100% hit that right there. And I think us guys are trying to catch up with that. I think that's a good point that you bring up. Yeah, I think it's so now it's gotten to a point where this point that you make about the lifelong learner, just always having that heightened curiosity again, love the word, love the choice that you made there with curiosity to have that curiosity and to almost assume that there's always more within you to grow into. Like, you know, again, you say you work on the business and not in the business. Mm -hmm. Working on the business allows you to grow said business. It allows you to see the things where you can grow. And if if we all work on ourselves as opposed to work in ourselves, mm -hmm. then we always have that ability to remain curious, to have that heightened awareness to like, hey, this is how I'm going to learn. This is how I'm going to receive what I'm doing well, what I can do better. And mm -hmm. leadership epitomizes the need for us to do that. We will never be a finished product as a leader, right? No, we won't. And I think that that's really important to keep in mind because you need to continue to evolve. And again, some of the best leaders that I've had the experience to be around, either tagging along with my followers' businesses or just through the customers that I'm around, a lot of the strongest leaders are open to continue. And they have that passion to continue learning and evolving. They never get tired of it. So I think that that compared to the individuals who are like, you know what? I got it all figured out. I don't need your help. You know what yeah. I call the know-it-alls, right? Yeah. Um, their growth gets stunted. And at some point, they'll just get leapfrogged. They'll get passed by. And I think great leaders, that worries them. That worries them that there's always more out there that they need to know that they can learn from anybody they talk to. And I think that sets the great leaders apart. Yeah. And it ties back into what you were saying earlier in terms of your <laughs> desire within your business to make sure that you're surrounding yourself with people that can feel empowered and take things off your, because they're going to teach you as much as anything going on within 100%. your world. I think that it all has this beautiful knock-on effect. When you start as a curious leader, you want to surround yourself with people that can educate you and impact you and keep you sharp and keep you honest. And that ties into integrity, et cetera. So it all has this beautiful snowball effect when you start right and you have that right perspective at the outset. And obviously we could just dive into a whole volume of, of podcast episodes on leadership right here, but I want to stop there mainly because I don't want to spoil all the good qualities right there in the book. People still need to go out and grab a copy for crying out loud. But what I do want to do, Damon, at the heart of this podcast is still that competitor. And so much of what you provided already should give people some great information in terms of, listen, if, if I am going to go either in my own direction and, and create my own thing, or if I'm right. going to focus on surrounding myself with the right people, then this is how I can do it according to some of these insights that you provide us so far. But I want to look at you now as the competitor. Like, How are you bridging, let's say, that conversation with yourself of, hey, today was a win versus today wasn't necessarily what I wanted it to be? How do you sort of go through that process? So there's two different ways that I do one for myself and then one for there with what I do for my sales team. Sure. For myself, I do what I call a big three, my three quarterly goals, no more than that. And then I have a big three weekly goals and then they're tied to the quarterly goals and then the daily big three. And I've gotten much better over the last couple of years of learning to write it down. I'm not, I wasn't a big writer before. I mean, when it comes to journaling. And so I start off every either Sunday night or Monday morning. And I think about what are my big three goals for the week? And then the first thing I do when I get to the office is I write down my big three for the day. And these are again on the business because you know how it is, Steve, sometimes you come into the office, you knock 25 things off your list. Then at the end of the day, you're like, well, I didn't really accomplish anything. And so those big three ideas for the day need to tie into my weekly, but more importantly, my quarterly goals. So if I, at the end of today, I'm able to check off at least two or three of those, then I know that I was able to focus on my business. And that to me, I consider to be a win. So that's what I do personally now. And it's all about progress because, you know, yes. it's like just making some progress. You don't, you can't swing for the fences all the time with my sales team. We have what we call mini steps and mini steps are just moving the ball down the field. And it's celebrating small wins. So it's booking a meeting, getting a customer to do a demo. And all our salespeople are required to have three mini steps a day. So they start off their day and they're like, they put it in a Google Doc. 
here are the three things that, and a mini step is something that not just you do, but you get customer involved in. So the customer agrees to a meeting and they agree to a demo, like I said, or they review a proposal. And then you celebrate those because like in American football, very rarely it's just a Hail Mary touchdown. You got to move the ball down the field. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I help my sales team celebrate those wins that helps them know that they're feeling like, especially the newer reps who don't have the success that some of the seniors do, it gives them the confidence that they're making that progress, Steve, day after day after day by focusing and getting these small wins to celebrate that lead to, the end of the day, a victory, a new customer. Exactly. And that's the point here is that the new customer isn't the only result to be measured here. There's mm -hmm. so many, many results, as you said, those many steps to measure, milestones. to acknowledge yeah. and milestones, et cetera. And the same goes for us too. Again, if you want to have a new habit, for instance, it doesn't start by just waking up one day and doing that habit for that one day. It's how can you implement those steps day in, day out towards whatever it is you in time want to be able to accomplish because of that habit. So again, so much of these insights, what I love about it, man, is like, here you are so many years down the line from when you really stepped into this entrepreneurial space and you're still adamant that the basics, right? It's the same as sport. If something's off in that swing, if something's off in that pitch, Go back to the basics always, right? Every coach told you the same thing. And it's the same for life. It's the same for business. It's the same for a career. Like being able to say, listen, whatever's going on, if it's not what you want it to be, how can you go back and not just review the basics, but then reestablish them, right? Because so much of what you're talking about here, Damon, is basics, basics, basics. You hit it on the head. To me, that's all that it is. Oh, I shouldn't say all, about 90%. Sure. Fundamentals and basics. There's a reason why Michael Jordan or Tiger Woods, they had coaches or trainers throughout their career. And a lot of times it was to keep them grounded into a lot of the basics. There's a reason why in Major League Baseball, you have spring training and you're just working on the fundamentals. And the same goes for business or even your personal life, right? If you feel like your nutrition's not good, you're gaining weight, well, go back to the basics. Figure out what you should be eating and just do that. None of this is rocket science. And that's kind of like what I talk a lot about in my book is it's like, this is a lot of fundamental, easily actionable items of things you can do that will get you where you're going. Of course, there's some great advanced tips and everything, but focus on the basics, get those done and be consistent, be yes. consistent with those basics. Which again, consistency is a fundamental. It's a fundamental, man. It's just like, again, showing up for practice every day with the right mindset, ready to go, warming up correctly. Like that is a consistent element. Same thing goes with the business. Same thing goes with the career. And like you said, same thing goes with uh, personal life too. So I just love this, Damon. And, and it, it's all such necessary information to always be heard. I don't think you can hear it too much. I loved hearing it from your perspective. But before I let you go, man, I'd love to allow you the opportunity just to tell everybody, firstly, where they can learn more about yourself. Secondly, where they can grab themselves a copy of the book too. Well, you can get a copy of my book, The Learn It All Leader, Mindset Traits and Tools on Amazon or Barnes and Noble, wherever they sell books. My website is learnit.com. Mm -hmm. And if you connect with me, L-E-A-R-N-I-T.com. And if you connect with me on LinkedIn, and if either you or high performer on your team want a free class, just connect with me on LinkedIn, shoot me a message and I'll get you a class, anything from Excel or how to give feedback or, you know, coach managers. So that's really the best place to find me, LinkedIn. Love it. Love it, man. Well, this has all been uh, all been wonderful. Like I said at the beginning, I was looking forward to having you on and, and that's been very much confirmed here through our time together. I could definitely keep going. I try to keep my episodes at a certain length and we've hit that time. But Damon, I think a 10, 20, maybe 50 more episodes down the road, something like that, I might have to just invite you back on and continue the conversation, brother. It was fun having you on. It was great to be on and keep up the great work. I've listened to several of your episodes and there's actionable takeaways in each of them. So I appreciate what you do. Thanks, man.